Well, welcome everyone to the, uh, to the speaker tonight at Almost Heaven Star Party. Our speaker tonight is Becca Lundgren, who is an, a, a science educator, a uh, professional science educator at the Smithsonian Institution, Air and Space Museum, and the Phoebe Wasserman Haas. I, I never get the It's all names, good. She had a lot of names. <laughs> um, uh, observatory. And uh, she does an, uh, an extensive amount of astronomy e outreach. And uh, in particular, she's been here twice, I think, now. Mm -hmm. And uh, is a great asset to the programs here and brings a lot of sunshine even on the rainy days because she's got a very good attitude all the time, Thank no matter you. how miserable things might appear to be. So please welcome uh, Becca Lundgren. Thanks, Alan. Thank you all for having me. And again, thank you to the AHSP staff for organizing this and the experience learning team for putting this on. It's always a blast for us. And even if I don't get to speak or interact with any of you, just being here is fantastic. So thank you for sticking around <laughs> um, to tonight. I know the weather's been iffy, but I, I did promise some of you I was going to show you some skies. Um, <laughs> they aren't these skies, though. Does anybody notice something in this picture that might look a little different than our skies? Maybe something right here, yeah. So these are skies from the Southern Hemisphere, which look a little different than ours because they're, uh, in, especially in this country, Chile, they're able to see a different part than we, we do. Now they still see the Milky Way, but again, a different part as well. And two of our biggest satellite galaxies, the Magellanic Clouds, small and large. So I got to see those when I was down there. Um, now a little bit quickly before we begin, I am an educator um, by trade. And so that means I love questions. If you have a question, please feel free to ask it in the middle of the talk. I'm not gonna be disrupted or disgruntled. I wanna have a conversation with you. Or if you wanna share a fun fact, please share. Um, um, I want this to be as interactive as possible, if I can help it. Um, oh, and uh, uh, if any of you want to visit me at the museum or get any of our resources before I begin, I do have my business card right here. So please um, come grab one so you can say hi to me later too. Um, so today we're going to explore a little bit of what makes Chile one of the best places in the world to do astronomy. I don't know if you've noticed a through line in a lot of the talks this weekend, but Chile has been mentioned over and over as the place that's going to answer a lot of big questions that we have about things like Oumuamua, the uh, asteroid, um, interstellar asteroid. It's going to answer questions about the origins of the universe, and Chile is where it's at. So we're going to dig a little deeper into that. We're also going to visit virtually some of the observatories that are in Chile because I got to go to Chile in January. So this is actually a picture of me um, in on Serra Tololo, one of the mountains there. Um, I'll show you some candid pictures, some fun ones of me and my team while we were down there and some nicer ones as well. But hopefully I'll give you a different view than a lot of the grand marketing photos that you often see of these observatories because we got to get up close and personal. Um, and I also want to discuss a little bit about how you can get involved in astronomy on Ch in Chile too. Um, this isn't just for, for me or for the people who already live down in South America or in Chile, you can be involved too. So a little bit of my background, why did I go to Chile? Um, I like to start with this picture. This is me um, probably in my first year working at the National Air and Space Museum as a part-time employee. I was a part-time staff member who had to wear a red polo, very specifically, that had our sponsorship on the side. Um, and I taught uh, families and people of all ages about the museum. And I knew next to nothing about half the stuff in this museum. This is about six, seven years ago now. Um, so by becoming an educator at the museum, I actually was inspired to do it professionally and it changed my entire career path. Um, and so the reason I, one of the big reasons I went to Chile is because I wanted to continue to inspire others uh, to explore new things. And what's uh, more new, especially for here, us in the United States, than exploring what the skies might be like in a different country. So I wanted to go to Chile to explore astronomy in a different hemisphere, one that I'd never been in. I'd never been south of the Bahamas before. Um, so this is brand new for me. Um, to connect with astronomers and educators from around the world because, as you'll see, um, Chile is an international uh, place for this collaboration. Um, and to learn new stories because who doesn't love fun new stories? And I learned a lot of them and hopefully I'll be able to share them with you today. Really fast, 
just to give you um, uh, some insight on this picture, this was taken by one of my cohort when I went down, um, when we were on top of a mountaintop. Um, this was his first run uh, that evening, um, doing a panorama and, ex and shortened exposure. Um, and he got a lot of other ones, but I love that this was the first picture he got when we were there. I thought it was really fantastic. And he didn't really try that hard. The skies were just that beautiful. All right. So I went to Chile as part of this program, the Astronomy in Chile Educator Ambassador Program. Mouthful, we call it ASAP normally. Um, here's our little logo. Whoop. There we go. Here's our little logo. We get little patches. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, and the whole program is run through uh, an organization that oversees the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, NRAL. A few of, did who went to Green Bank yesterday? few of you. So it used to be run by NRAO. Um, and NRAO runs a lot of different radio astronomy observatories around the world, um, or, or at least does the United States um, funding portion of it. Um, so this program is thro through their organization. Um, and this was my cohort that we went with in January 2018. So Tim Spuck, he's from NRAO or from AUI. Uh, um, and then I had some planetarium directors like Pat Hanrahan, um, Joel Goodman, some of you may or may not know him. He's a, uh, yes, fantastic. Um, he is an amateur astronomer in Maryland um, and he does fantastic outreach and he uh, former dentist as well. Um, Jack Howard, who's a professor and amateur astronomer in North Carolina and Kip Beals, who's actually a medical professional um, and who really loves astronomy and amateur astronomy as well. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about this program um, at the end too, but this was a group of people just like you and I in this room. We had to apply to be part of it, um, and I'll show you how you can apply um, as well. But it's meant to take people who might not normally get the opportunity. Maybe they don't have the opportunity to travel there for vacation. Maybe they don't do research down there, so they can't get there through work. Um, to be able to go and experience it firsthand and be able to share it with you. The main mission of ASAP is to create a better informed citizenry to help you all understand what's going on down there so that we know where our tax dollars are and what's going on um, with all of that. So hopefully you'll learn a little bit more about that too. This is our cohort on top of a mountain. We were a little woozy. We're already at 10,000 feet there. <laughs> um, so uh, you'll see it's some goofy pictures as well. Um, so a little bit about Chile. What country is this? Not Chile, <laughs> the United States. I wanted to start with something familiar. We're, we're right over here in West Virginia. Um, but with uh, Chile, it's about this big. It's over 2,600 miles long. Um, and it's a very skinny country. It's not um, oriented like this east to west. It's actually flipped north to south. Because of that, the entire country is extremely diverse. It has a lot of different climates. In the south, it's very temperate, kind of like Canada. It has lots of temperate rainforests. Um, in the middle, you're going to have kind of a nice region um, with that has all the seasons. Santiago is a part of that. And then in the north, there's actually deserts areas. Um, and we're going to visit a few of those today. Um, and so Chile, because of that uh, diversity of climates, already makes it a great candidate just to go on vacation because <laughs> you can do so many things in just one country. But on top of that, it makes for really good astronomy. So here I want to start uh, show you a little bit of map of the places that I got to visit. I didn't go to Antofagasta this time, but I did go to Calama. This area in Chile has really fantastic circumstances that all come together to make it an amazing place to do astronomy. So like I said before, we have different climates. Well, this is the area where you're going to get a lot of dry, desert-like climates. You're also going to get a lot of high places. The higher you go, the less air is between you and the end of the atmosphere, so the better astronomy you're going to be able to do. There's just less air in between you and your instruments. And finally, oh, did you have a question? Yeah. 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 Oh, that totally makes sense. If I, I hadn't heard of that, I heard of that specific mountain before, but that totally makes sense. It's really, really high up, um, it, especially with the Andes mountain range being right along here, right along the border between Chile, Argentina, and Bolivia. Thank you so much for sharing. So it definitely, because of it, how high it is, how dry it is, and the chance that it's 
being sort of near the coast, but also having this mountain making a microclimate that doesn't mean it has bad weather all the time means it's an amazing place to do astronomy. Who here would want to be in a place that's really dry and high enough that doesn't have rain all the time? I think we would all, especially here today, <laughs> would love to be in a place like that, right? Um, because that's not what we're getting is in a lot of places here in the United States. Not every place. There are some great places. But really, all of this coming together makes Chile an amazing place to be. And we um, nowadays, we aren't the only people to have known that about Chile. People have been going to Chile from around the world to do astronomy since the middle of the 1800s. And before that, people uh, who have lived in Chile for a long time, including the indigenous people of Chile, have been doing astronomy as well because they knew they had something special there. I'll show you a place that's had astronomy happening there for uh, millennia through the indigenous cultures. And in Santiago, the National Observatory there was built in the late 1800s by the Chilean government um, with no outside resources. So everyone was already recognizing that this was a place to be um, for astronomy. So first we're going to travel to Santiago. That's where I flew in, so that's where we're going to start. And we're actually going to start with one of the newer types of astronomy or um, astronomy experiences that's bursting onto the scene in Chile and kind of here in the United States too. And that is astrotourism, astroturismo. Who here has been on like an astrotourism excursion? few of you what was it like would you mind sharing oh yes excellent so yeah going on cruises uh, eclipse cruises definitely astrotourism definitely can be fantastic if you have the chance so astrotourism the whole idea is that you're not there to kind of rough it or if you are, it's part of the experience and you want it. <laughs> um, but you're there um, to have an experience with astronomy that might feel like you're at a resort. Maybe you're on a cruise. Maybe it's all inclusive. It could be a variety of different experiences. Um, but people who are not like us, who are already interested in astronomy, are paying for these experiences. So this is actually one of the most popular observatories there, Ob Observatorio Astronomico Andino. So um, it's the Astronomic Observatory of the Andes. It's right outside of um, Santiago on the hillside. Actually, right behind that little hill is downtown Santiago. So we drove up. It's only about 2,000 miles above sea level um and these were the skies 2,000 feet oh my gosh I kept doing that earlier oh gosh well that's yeah wow you'd be you know pretty far into space at 2,000 miles <laughs> thank you 2,000 feet above sea level um so not too high up in the mountains either and these are the night skies up there what do we see right here Milky Way and a Magellanic cloud, exactly. This is my team there that took a 10 second burst um, exposure. But it, th this whole setup was uh, where you were wined and dined and astronomined. I don't know, that doesn't really work, but it was that kind of experience. They had pillars with giant telescopes out here. They had two rollback observatories. They had the and, uh, um, these beautiful lounge areas um, where you could sit and have a glass of Chilean wine or a soda, have some cheese, and crackers, look at beautiful astronomy images, listen to some talks like you're doing now. Uh, <laughs> and you could even take your own photographs through their very um, nice system. This is a photograph of a photograph. I wanted to capture kind of the whole computer and the system itself. Um, but they made it so that people could pay to be like you and I here, <laughs> essentially, but without a lot of the amazing work and practice that you all have put in. Yeah. Totally. It, yeah, it's not free. Um, so <laughs> it isn't free. This was about $100 for a few hours of experience with all of that included. Um, and you could have events there. People would set up their weddings there, corporate events, things like that. So it was really interesting to see this totally different side of astronomy that I didn't expect to see going there. I expected to see research facilities, scientists, and engineers. And the first thing we did was see something completely different. So commercial astronomy yep astrotourism is what they call it oh yeah astrotourism is what they call it and so um in chile it's really bur uh, a burgeoning industry there's so many different places just like this and i don't know if you've noticed things like that have started to pop up in the united states as well or at least different resorts and hotels have started to kind of say hey we might do a night sky tour later 
hey, we might take you on a hike where we can see the Milky Way later. So people are starting to catch on that astronomy is really cool <laughs> and charging money for it in a lot of cases. But it was really an interesting experience. So after that, we traveled from Santiago all the way up to La Serena. Um, so it, here's kind of a zoomed in view where you can see a lot of the different observatories here. The biggest observatories that are in Chile all are in two regions, the Coquimbo region and the, um, the three regions really, the Atacama region and the Antofagasta region. That's kind of like counties um, in Chile. Um, and that's where the weather is just the best. All of those things I talked about before come together to really make an amazing viewing experience. Um, so we're gonna talk about these few observatories here first. So La Serena, is a beach town. Um, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm trying to show you pictures that I took or my cohort took, so it's not the best quality, um, but it was beautiful. You can see the town of Coquimbo in the distance, um, and it's really popular tourist destination. It's also where the offices of a lot of observatories are, which sounds kind of nice, right? These, this is where these scientists get to live. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, great question. I went during the summer, so it wasn't that bad. A lot of people were swimming. Um, it's kind of in the middle of Chile, La Serena, so the temperature is pretty nice. And a lot of people were playing on the beach when I was there. It was also the first time I got to put my feet in the Pacific Ocean, which was really exciting for me, even though it was all the way in another hemisphere. <laughs> That's how long it took me. So maybe I should get to California or Washington one of these days. Um, La Serena is a pretty cool place, and I just want to plug really fast a really cool event that's happening there next year. Um, here's La Serena, and here's this like weird map. What do you think this map stands for? An eclipse. You can just shout it out. It's an eclipse path. Exactly. Totality is going right over La Serena. The eclipse is in the late afternoon evening on July 2nd of 2019. And a ton of astronomical organizations are already planning their meetings in La Serena during that time. I know the IAU is planning a meeting. There's a bunch of different organizations. If you're looking for a place to go, this might be it or somewhere nearby because it's already beautiful and you get to see a really cool eclipse. It, it probably is. The good thing is there's another one just the next year in 2020 um, that's just down the coast. So you can go to Santiago too. Yeah. It is interesting, isn't it? Yeah. We can talk a little bit about um, the physics of eclipses and all that later and how we can predict them, but I love watching the patterns of how they work. So we traveled from La Serena on a little road up to Cerro Tololo and Cerro Pachon, right up here. Um, those are uh, two mountaintops. Cerro um, means little mountain or hill. Um, and so it, all of these little places, all these little hills have their own name. Now, when we were up here, you could actually see across to one mountain and the other. And on top of both of these mountains, Cerro Tololo and Cerro Pachon, are two observatories, are two observatory complexes. So you can see little domes from across the way, which is a really cool experience. I'm not used to having that experience here in the United States. So the first mountaintop we visited was Cerro Pachon, where we saw this telescope, Gemini South. Has anybody heard of Gemini before? Where is the other Gemini telescope? Hawaii, yes. Yeah, th that's a good guess. It might be across the street, right? In Cerro Tololo. That's a really good guess. In this case, though, they chose to put a telescope, one here on Cerro Pachon, and one on a mountaintop in Hawaii. Why do you think they would do that? Yeah, creating a big telescope. Interferometry is basically using different telescopes to create one big telescope so you can get bigger images, more of the sky. By having a telescope in Chile and one in Hawaii, Gemini is able to essentially get all of the sky at, in, at a certain time. So this is a really important tool that's been used on a lot of occasions to be able to track things all across the skies we see from here on Earth. So this is a picture I took um, when we first arrived there at Gemini. We got to watch them calibrate a bunch of things, including their telescope, which was really cool to see on the inside. This is, again, another picture I took. I was still learning the settings on my camera, so the beautiful lights are looking a little bit weird. Um, but this telescope has been in action for many years now, making lots of really cool discoveries. It's an 8.1 meter telescope, so thinking about the diameter of the mirror. And on the bottom here, you can actually replace up to 10 instruments at any given time, and they can be rotated around depending on what they're viewing that night. So you can use all 10 of those instruments at night. You don't really want to, because that's a lot of work shifting it around for the engineers, but it's a really dynamic telescope. They can do a lot of really cool research. 
some of the research we've already talked about this weekend, which is fantastic. Yet last night, um, uh, I think it was Rob, uh, uh, Robert Nye uh, talked about Oumuamua, uh, the interstellar asteroid that visited our solar system. Gemini was able to continue tracking it after the telescopes in Hawaii lost it. Gemini South picked up and was able to continue looking at it. So it was a seamless operation. And this is um, a uh, uh, compilation of images it took to start to give us an uh, idea of what its color might be. It also, Gemini was also part of the tele uh, big telescope group that was able to image the optical counterpart to gravitational waves. Um, so I, who here has heard of a gravitational wave before? few of you, different than gravity waves, those happen here on the Earth. Um, gravitational waves are the idea um, that at a big event, two big things smashing into each other can create so, uh, give off so much energy that they actually ripple space and time. And we wanted to measure that. Scientists want to measure that because that sounds pretty cool, right? So scientists started measuring that, trying to measure it for a while and first got, their, they got their first, uh, listen to it, even though it's not a sound, um, uh, a few years ago. Last year, they heard another one. They think it was two neutron stars colliding. And so when they heard it, Gemini South and a few other telescopes immediately pointed to that area. And if you look at this tiny little red circle, that's the visual representation of those two neutron stars bursting together, getting really bright, and then fading out after the burst. Yeah. Whoa, are you thinking of fast radio bursts? Maybe? Yeah. Yeah, that could be one of the reasons, exactly. There's an amazing amount of data that's been collected by satellites that weren't supposed to be collecting it. <laughs> and um, hopefully a lot of that data will become declassified um, as time goes on so that sci more scientists can take a crack at it. But that's a really good point. Thank you for sharing that too. So Gemini has been critical um, for a lot of really cool astronomy that's happening right now. Um, when we were down there, we also got to visit their offices and we actually got to hang out with some school kids that were in La Serena. Now, it was their summer break, so they came in on their summer break just to say hi to us, which was really nice of them. And we actually built spectrographs. Does anybody here have still have their little spectrograph? I know Jillian was handing them out, or the little diffraction grading. A few of you do. Yeah, they had the same ones, Rainbow Symphony um, diffraction gratings in Chile. And they made little um, spectrographs out of paper tubes, and we tried out different lights. Anybody know what this light is? Sodium light. Kind of looks like the sun, doesn't it? It's very yellow. In this case, it's um, just sodium. Yeah. So we got to try it out. It was a lot of fun to see the same things that you all and myself are doing here in the United States as outreach tactics. Same thing that Gemini is doing down there. So that was a fun little visit. Does anybody have any questions about the Gemini telescope? It's funded in part by the NSF or National Science Foundation here in the United States. That's another reason why we visited it. So after going, after being on Sarah Pachon, um, we, we walked down the hill a little bit to visit SOAR, the Southern Astrophysical Research Telescope. This is a, a 4.1 meter telescope, so a little bit smaller than Gemini. And this is uh, them staring at a white field doing some calibrations, um, which was really fun to be in the room while it was happening. It was very dark. Um, and we got to hear a little bit about the amazing science being done there too. It's a really quick telescope. It can slew really fast. And it also ha takes images that are almost as good as the Hubble Space Telescope. So a lot of the science being done there is really exciting. They get really great images as well. So it was fun to s and it's a really small little dome, so it was fun to be inside. So after that, we, visit we went across the way to the other mountaintop, which we can see from afar, um, Cerro Tololo, which houses the Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory, or CTIO. Has anybody here heard of CTIO? Maybe this weekend even? Yeah? Um, when we were talking about Skynet earlier today, one of the Skynet telescopes is here on CTIO. It's actually over 20 telescopes um, that, uh, or small observatories that sit on this mountaintop. So it's really an international collaboration. A lot of it is funded by the United States, the National Os um, Optical Astronomy Observatory, NOAO. NRAO is the counterpart, yeah? I took this picture. And I'll tell you where in a few moments, because it was from a really cool place. Um, I'm trying to show you almost, I, I'll, I'll let you know when it's not one of my pictures or my cohort's pictures. Um, 
but it was really cool to be up here and see all these uh, different telescopes. Um, so uh, because it has so many telescopes, some people deem it the mushroom farm from above because it looks like a bunch of little mushrooms, and I agree. These are actually the prompts. Um, Skynet, uh, which you learned about a few days ago, has one of these prompts online that can open up remotely and take pictures of the sky from Chile. So you can apply for time from that on Skynet. I definitely recommend it. It's a really cool uh, program. There's also a few telescopes run by Google here. And my favorite one was the telescope that belonged to the Princess of Thailand, who loves astronomy. And so she actually um, funds one of these little telescopes and remotely uses it. So isn't that cool? Um, <laughs> I thought, and it has her name and her seal on it and everything. We weren't allowed inside though. Most of them, we were actually allowed inside. I actually went into one of them to get a laundry pod and some super glue because my sunglasses broke. And the, the engineers were like, oh, there's some super glue and prompt date. Just go over there and get some. <laughs> so it was really cool experience to be up there and to be interacting with these observatories in a very casual way, one that I wasn't used to. We were living on this mountaintop with them, too, in the dorms that the scientists normally stay in. Did you have a question? That's where the storage was. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. So most of these prompts, if you see this kind of line here, there's actually kind of a storage area, an office area underneath. Then you walk up a, a short little flight of stairs. It's almost like a stool. And the little telescope is right up here. Mm -hmm. So you can technically sit underneath and use a telescope, but all of them are remote. So you don't even have to be there except to fix things. Great question. So walking up from prompt, you can see a lot more of the telescopes up here. They have tons of solar telescopes, tons of remote telescopes, and they also have the four meter Blanco telescope. This telescope is really cool. It actually has a twin here in the United States. Does anybody know where that twin is? Kit Peak, the Mayal telescope, that's exactly right. So they're twin telescopes. This one's down um, in Chile, and it's named after Victor Blanco, who was a Puerto Rican astronomer. And so this telescope was actually the biggest of its time when it was built all the way up until 1998. So it was really big deal Oh, in the Southern Hemisphere, pardon me. Um, so it was a really big deal, did a lot of really cool science and still does. I think my favorite part about visiting this telescope, well, I had two favorite parts. My favorite part about visiting this telescope was seeing this big black thing right here. This big black thing is the dark energy survey camera. The dark energy survey camera is taking a crazy amount of pictures every night, um, surveying hundreds of thousands of galaxies all the time, looking for evidence of dark matter. So it's looking for uh, all that evidence, but because it's looking for that evidence, it also picks up other things along the way. So this is actually one of its most recent, dis the, one of the most recent discoveries. Um, Nora Ship, I think, is a scientist out of University of Chicago who was looking at the data, looking for evidence of dark matter, right? Because that's the main goal of all this data, and found something completely different. They found by looking at the brightness and density of the stars in the data, this is a, the um, um, brightness and density laid out in a map, they found things called star streams, ripped apart um, globular clusters and satellite galaxies that are around our Milky Way swirling around it. We only knew about four or five before. They discovered 11 in this data. You can actually see the names. They, let, they had school children in Chile name all of these star streams as well. So these are all indigenous um, names important to the children there. Did you have a question? I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> so it's also doing really cool science, especially with that deep sky camera. To look back at that deep sky camera, this, I mean, here are some little pulleys and things like that here. Um, it's a huge telescope. This actually used to be where somebody could sit and put photographic plates into the telescope back when they were using plates still. So there was a, hu a human-sized basket there before, um, <laughs> before this camera was installed. So it's a big telescope. We got to see it being calibrated and turned and everything like that. We also got to go up on its catwalk, which was really cool. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> We're like, oh, gosh, I'm all the way back on this other side. The door's over here. And I was pretty freaked out at first. Um, but you can see the, that's the angle of the picture, that first picture I showed you. Um, normally, you don't go up, but we became really good friends with the scientists working there at the time. And we were only there for two nights, but they were really awesome. They were all from the University of Michigan, all working with the deep sky camera. And they invited us in to go up on the catwalk to do their calibrations with them. And then 
they let us sit there while they were collecting data that night. So that was really cool. Um, even though the control rooms are just a bunch of computers, you're not sitting there with an eye to an eyepiece, it was still awesome to be able to watch the scientists doing their work. Um, so really cool experience being up there. Has anybody here been on a catwalk of a really big telescope? No? Maybe a building, yeah, maybe a few. Where, which telescope? Kit Peak, that one's really cool too. And actually a few of my fellow cohort likened it to the experience at Kit Peak. So if you have a chance and you're at a big observatory, I'd recommend it. Though make sure you somebody knows you're up there first. <laughs> Otherwise it could be dangerous. Um, so when we were out there, we did get to take a few pictures. This one's not processed. Um, I wanted to show you um, my first two ever pictures that I took that were longer exposures. I, have not pr I had not processed them, processed them at the time that I made this presentation a few months ago, and I kind of like leaving it there just to see what the skies look like if you're not playing with it at all with some fun software. It's pretty cool to see. Um, and this was, uh, we didn't have very uh, much moon at all or anything like that. I think it was just past noon. Um, yeah, so it's bright. Those are that starlight shining off of the dome. Um, so it was a pretty incredible experience. Here are those two satellite galaxies, the large and small Magellanic cloud again. So it was very cool to see. Pardon? I don't. I actually don't. That's a really great question. Thank you. I appreciate that. Fantastic. 70 degrees south is the declination. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty far, but they were pretty high up that night, which was really a fantastic experience. You also got to go, got to know the wildlife this same night. I, I encountered my very first scorpion of a large size um, in our, on our, it was about that big in our dorms, and we got to catch it in a teacup and throw it outside before it did any harm. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> right, <laughs> like Princess Bride, exactly. <laughs> Definitely scorpions, uh, probably of a normal size for them, but an unusual size for me. It was a definitely an experience. Pardon? 30 seconds. Yes. And I, I, I am not an experienced astrophotographer yet. This is actually my first time trying it out. Yes, and I did use a star tracker. Mm-hmm, yeah. Yeah, thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. It was just, it was really fun to be able to do it here. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. That's exactly right. Totally. Totally. That's a really good observation. Thank you for pointing that out. It was definitely weird seeing so many things in a different position than I thought they were supposed to be, including the moon. I mean, the moon was just past new and it was going the wrong direction. So I didn't know how to handle that. It's like, what? <laughs> It was disorienting, but really cool because that's their norm. So they must feel the same way when they come here. <laughs> and I don't know how people feel on the equator. So, yeah. Yes, I was. It was very low on the horizon um, most of the time when we were there or when I was up. <laughs> um, I'm mostly a solar astronomer, um, so daytime's my jam. Um, but when we were able to see it, um, it was spectacular. So. Yeah, that was a really cool experience. You can see that from the United States if you go far, far south in Florida. So, yes, just a little bit. Just peaks above the horizon. All right. So when we were up on, C um, on CTIO, um, we got to visit this telescope. It looks a little beat up. Um, it's a little scratched. That's because it traveled all the way from Yale to Chile to continue doing its work. Yale retired, right? <laughs> Yale retired this telescope. Everyone's like, what do we do with it? So they decided to ship it to Chile because if you take good care of a telescope, it can last a really long time and still do really cool science. And so they shipped this telescope all the way to Chile. It's a Boiler and Chivins design. Does anybody recognize this telescope, Cal? 
<laughs> it looks just like my telescope at my observatory because this is the younger cousin of this telescope. Our Bowler and Shivens was at Harvard teaching students how to use telescopes just like the Yale One Meter before it was loaned to us permanently for doing things like you visiting us and looking through it. So it was fun to walk in and say, I know that telescope and be in a completely different place in the world. It was also fun visiting this telescope because we were there at night. Here is the camera, the little camera in, um, that was attached to it. It was actually following asteroids, near-Earth asteroids. Our friend that we visited down there was actually sitting there, had a big long list on his computer of about 60 to 80 near-Earth asteroids, and that night he had to make sure to track every single one and make sure the trajectory was not towards Earth. That's his job while he's down there. Now, it can be done remotely. He was also there to fix some instruments. Um, but it was really cool to see that in action and see the type of telescopes that are being used to essentially, what well, with NASA's uh, work, protect us potentially from these uh, different objects. So I, that was a really uh, fantastic treat. He was also doing some, some other work while he was there because remember, it's not all eyes to eye pieces. It's collecting data and monitoring that data as it, come in, as it comes in. So after we visited, does anybody have any questions about CTIO? Yeah. Yes. Tell his boss probably <laughs> first. <laughs> there's probably a lot of pro. Yeah, there's a button, a big red button. <laughs> um, there's probably a lot of protocols in place, but that's probably the first thing is alert a lot of people. <laughs> right. And, and there's probably a lot of other telescopes that could be turned to track just that thing. Just the, in the case of Gemini, which it got turned to track moi, moi, so quickly, um, that usually is at the discretion of the director of the observatory. The director gets a certain amount of time on each telescope, and if it's something cool like that or something scary, they can say, hey, you got to look at this thing right now. Um, I actually didn't talk about that at first, and I was going to. In terms of telescope time, you have to apply most of the time for telescope time. But if you are the director, you get, I think, 2 or 3% always. You can, and it's at your discretion. And if you live in Chile, you have um, there's 10% of telescope time in all telescopes built in Chile dedicated to Chilean astronomers. You still have to apply as part of the system, but it's already there. It's already dedicated, which is a great relationship and partnership to foster people who are interested in astronomy in their own country. Pardon? Kind of like a tariff, yes, because <laughs> a lot of these, um, a lot of these projects are, um, in this case, CTIO, Inter-American, South and North America, Central America, different countries coming together. Some of them are global pursuits. And that's actually where we went next. So we went from, uh, oops, Cerro Tololo up to Alma in the north, in the Antofagasta region, which is part of the Atacama Desert. So the Atacama Desert spans this entire region. Um, of Chile and a little farther up as well. So we had visited these optical and infrared telescopes. Oh, I'd forgotten to mention that. Most of those were optical or near infrared. Um, so things where we can see with our eyes are just a little bit cooler. And so we went up north to visit something that was looking at a type of light we can't normally see with our eyes at all. Does anybody have a guess what Alma normally looks at? What kind of light can't we see with our eyes normally? We can't see infrared, radio waves, microwaves, yep, x-rays. In this case, it's the radio waves and the microwaves, millimeter and submillimeter uh, wavelengths of light that Alma's looking at. So we'll talk about that, that space and why, why it's so important for that in a second. To get up there, um, you actually have to travel all the way to Kalama or onto Vagasta. You have to fly in and you have to take a three or hour drive or bus ride all the way to the closest town, San Pedro de Atacama. There are people coming from all over the world taking this trip, which is actually, once you get to the country, still a pretty long trip. It's an international collaboration between Japan, ESO, which is the European Southern Observatory, and AREO, which is the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, and ALMA, which is the kind of the Chilean cohort that organizes things there. So all the people who are working on this telescope and other people from around the world have to travel all the way to Chile first, usually fly into Santiago or another big city, fly to Calama or to Fagasta, drive all the way to San Pedro de Atacama before they even get close to Alma. It's in a remote spot for a reason. This is actually the remote spot that I'm talking about. This is the Ata part of the Atacama Desert. Um, these are salt flats, Valle de la Luna. Um, and so it's really dry, really arid. A lot of this area back here, you can start to see where there used to be a lake. That's just salt. It's just straight salt. It's all dried up. 
The biggest town, though, in this area is San Pedro de Atacama, and it's the second busiest town in Chile sometimes of the year. It's a huge tourist destination. It's actually a really fun little town. No buildings are really higher than this. Maybe the church and the police station. Um, it has a lot of really good restaurants. I definitely recommend it. Um, and a lot of things to do outside of astronomy. So people go there all the time anyway. Next door though is Alma. And so you go and stay in this town and you can even live in this town if you work at Alma. So you have to drive a little bit farther up about 10,000 feet above sea level at, in, at San Pedro. You're about 8,000 feet above sea level. Um, and up here at 10,000, you get to kind of the ground base of Alma. I like to show this picture because this is Almito. He's one of the stray dogs in San Pedro. One day he showed up at the observatory and didn't let leave. He is there for good. He has a dog house right behind him back because it's so high up in, on earth. He actually gets a sunburn on his nose all the time. Um, and I mean, he's not bothered by it. I think he's lived with it his entire life. But he showed up about uh, three or four years ago and he's still there. I'll meet though. And he guards the gate. So you can always see him when you go, when you go up. They actually posted about him on Instagram the other day. So I was glad to see I'll meet though. Um, so when you drive up to the ground base, the operations facility, OSF, um, you can see a lot of their offices. That was the cool experience for me. This is actually Fabiola. She's the head engineer at Alma. Um, she has a team of about 70 engineers, and she is one of two women um, and in that team of engineers, and she's in charge. She does a lot of really cool work, and a lot of it is helping monitor the equipment that is going into these large telescopes, including this piece right here. D does anybody recognize this piece? I know we already talked about it. Anybody recognize this? Or have an idea what part of the telescope this might be? That's a good guess. That's a really good guess. Maybe it could help drive the telescope. In this case, it's actually in the back of the telescope, and they can drive it remotely. Good guess, though. Or they can move them using large structures. In this case, it's, yeah, it's the sensor. Somebody said that. This is the cryostat. It keeps the sensors that take the, that wavelengths of radio light and transmit them to this huge computer that only does one thing, and that's trans um, um, bring all the data together and transmit it down this huge tube down the hill to then be parceled out, to then be processed, around the world um, and it has to be at a very very cold temperature to operate they're only open twice a year and Fabiola was like hey I got one open do you want to see it <laughs> and we said yes <laughs> we definitely do <laughs> so it was a really cool experience to be able to see these instruments firsthand um, and and to be able to get close though not too close because even the electricity in our hands could have fried any of the electronics in the cryostat so we had to be very careful around it so we got a tour of the, the facilities people do live there at 10,000 feet above sea level, though not for long. I think it's three week rota rotations. They go in and out. So you're there for three weeks working seven days a week or maybe one day off. And then you're off maybe for months, maybe for a few weeks. And then you come back. It's an interesting way of working. And a lot of the people at Alma really enjoy it because they get to spend time with their families um, when they're not there, um, especially for a long time. Um, but then you have to be up on this mountaintop for a long time too. So there's balances there. It's a fairly new observatory. It only opened about five years ago. And so they're still um, adjusting to what this experience is like, whereas CTIO has been there since the 1960s. So to give you a little perspective, when we were down at um, OSF, we were about this high above sea level about 10,000 feet. Here are some other um, observatories that you might recognize here in the United States. We talked about Kitt Peak already. The very large array, the VLA, out in the southwest United States, is another radio astronomy observatory that's um, organized by NRAO again um, and does a lot of really cool research out there. Here's Keck. Here is where Alma is. Whoa, it's high up. That's 16,500 feet or 5,000 meters above sea level. Why do you think it is so high above sea level? Yeah. Totally. Much less light pollution, which is nice, um, for sure, with a lot of these high mountain tops. And also, 
the big thing is there's less atmosphere. Radio waves are huge. In some cases, they can be as big as a football field in how big they are. And as opposed to the optical light, um, the wavelengths we can see, they're small enough they fit into our eyeballs. That's how we're able, I'm able to see all of you today. With ALMA, being high above the atmosphere, about halfway up, means that the radio waves have less to interfere with. And so you can get more accurate and precise data. Because of that ALMA and because of the structure of the array, it is one of the most precise radio instruments in the world. So there's about 66 of an antennas, uh, these, these antennas all together, what you can call the telescope or the observatory itself. And 64 of them are, are working at any given time. I don't know if you remember a picture a little bit back. That mountain was a mountain in the past picture. Now it's like the same height uh, in this picture. And this is all the Andes Mountains here in the back of some volcanoes, which we saw venting. That was pretty cool. Though they vent towards Bolivia, not towards the telescope, which is nice. Um, so 64 of the um, um, antennas will be working at any given time in a shape that they call the array. This array can expand out. You can actually see some of the spots where they drive out to to make it um, have more collecting power, but that means the resolution or the image won't be as sharp. Um, or they can concentrate the array, make it smaller. So they have a sharper image, but they're not collecting as much data. So it just depends on what kind of science they're wanting to do. And here's that base up there at 16,500 pe people sit there and they're like eating lunch, working on their computers, hanging out. Great question. So it just depends on the type of science they're do doing and also the size of the, of the uh, antenna itself. Not all the antennas are the same size, nor are they built by the same country. So sometimes that also governs what they're looking at. The uh, different um, array, uh, d different antennas are built by the United States. Japan and Europe and you can actually tell by their structure which one's which um, and because of that too some of them are different sizes and so they're going to be looking at different wavelengths of light or different areas of the sky but because it's an interferometer so it's taking all of these images coming together to create one image it is able to create kind of a puzzle piece view of the sky and a bigger picture than just one antenna would be able to look at on its own kind of like how Green Bank does it or Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. They just have one big antenna. Great question. But yeah, 16,500 feet, there, the offices are oxygenated. So they have that flowing pretty regularly up there. I did sit for a long time just looking and breathing <laughs> in a lot of that good oxygen. And then um, we went out onto the field and wore oxygen tanks. Um, this is my friend Jessica Harris. She's actually a STEM educator at NRAO, and she was with us on the trip. Um, and we got to visit it both for the very first time while we were up there. I think she's gotten to visit the LA too, but this was my first um, high sight experience, and it was pretty amazing. You have to walk really slow if you've never been up that high before. Breathe very, very deeply, and make sure you're not getting disoriented. After you get over all of that, you get to see the beauty of these antennas. They're huge. This is actually a human-sized door right here. So to give you a perspective of how big these antennas are. And we got to see a lot of engineers, oop, like Wilhelmina, this is us up at the high site with um, taking a picture of her climbing into the antennas and doing maintenance. She actually was kind of annoyed that she had to wear the oxygen tank. It's a new rule that they all have to wear it because before they'd just gotten used to it. So they would go up and only carry oxygen for emergencies. Now they have to lug the whole thing on their back, even while crawling through the antennas. You and then you. Yeah. You brought up a really good point. What What is it going to be like in remote areas of, the, of, of our universe or our world, and how can humans survive there, right? Um, the Atacama Desert is a fantastic analog for these harsh environments. There's actually a few places around the world that are like that, including a place in Hawaii where the high seas team actually put people in a dome to simulate what it would be like on Mars. And people go to Chile, the Atacama Desert, all the time to study that harsh environment. It's so dry. There's barely any plants in if at all, 
There are some animals, viscachas and vicuñas. Vicuñas are kind of like llamas. Viscachas are like big bunnies, and they love it up there. But they also evolved to live up there. We didn't, <laughs> us humans, or at least us humans here from West Virginia and Virginia and Maryland didn't evolve to be up in these places. Um, for very long. So it's a really good point. It's a really good place to do that kind of study and work too. Thank you. Yeah. Oxygen generators. Yes. Yes. Um, so that's what they used to use. Um, now they, they have to have a whole tank for security reasons. Just, uh, just, just health, health and security reasons. It, it's kind of like a fail safe. If everybody has it, then no one needs the the emergency evacuation. Yeah. It th again, new observatory. So shifting rules, figuring it out, making sure everything's working for everybody. So <laughs> I wasn't their health off. I didn't meet their health officer. So I don't know how he, how or he or she or they made those decisions. Um, but it is interesting to see how a newer organization is kind of finding their way and developing all of their rules. Because it does work in a lot of ways differently than observatories um, normally would work. It hires a lot of people from Chile um, are doing a lot of the work, not just of astronomy, but engineering. Um, they're, they're monitoring the telescopes. Um, and it's a really big industry um, for locals to get into. And so a lot of the observatories actually have huge outreach programs. They go to the schools, they're out in the community, because they know that this could be a really cool job for the community as well. Um, and I know all of you do that evangelizing for our astronomy and observatories here in the United States, but these people get paid for it, <laughs> which is really nice. And hopefully, hopefully that trend will start to spread um, elsewhere in the world. Um, so Alma has made some pretty amazing discoveries. And again, some discoveries we've already heard about this weekend because they're integral to the way we're understanding the universe. Um, these, uh, we saw this image uh, last night, again, HL Tau. Um, does anybody remember what these images show? Exoplanets, planets forming, Pro we, what scientists like to call protoplanetary disks. So they're not quite planets. There's definitely a young star there, um, and we can't see the planets are themselves, but we can start to see a potential pathways that these planets are carving out around their stars, which we never were able to see before. Alma took these pictures. This was um, this one actually, I think, was one of the first pictures it took, but it's taken so many more since then. I love this one. Look how circular that orbit is. Wow. Did you have another question? Well, if we could travel light speed or faster, I think things would be a different story for sure. Um, but in terms of these, yeah, these formed a long time ago, depending on where they are in the universe. If it's closer to us, it's going to be a little younger. If it's farther away in our galaxy, a little older um, on the scale of hundreds of thousands to millions of years. Oh, great question. That's actually something that these pictures are going to help scientists determine because we've not seen this part of the process quite yet. Before we were seeing the poplids, the baby stars, and then we were seeing finished solar systems or what we think are finished solar systems because we're seeing planets cross in front of their stars. But where does that delineation occur? It could be on the scale of hundreds of thousands to millions of years. The idea right now that it could be on the scale of hundreds of thousands of years that this formation is occurring, but that's not a question scientists quite know the answer to yet. Or if there is a paper out there, please somebody point me to it. Because a lot of this is very new science. I think there was another one. Yeah. No, that's actually another protoplanetary disk. All of these colors are arbitrary. That's something really good to remember. Um, so with radio wavelengths, we can't normally see them with our eyes. So whenever a color is overlaid on the data, it doesn't actually mean anything. Sometimes uh, scientists like to use reds and oranges for data. That's radio or infrared or microwave because it's cooler. And everything on our visible spectrum that is cooler starts to go towards the red. But again, completely arbitrary. So I assume uh, this is an estimation and it could be wrong, but they just picked a color in this case. Great question, though. I should look it up later. They also not just are looking at the origins of planets, but the origins of our uh, cosmos. They actually, on the wall, 
when we first walked into their main offices, it literally says like discovering our origins in very like big bold letters. Um, and hopefully that'll be the case. They're really excited to explore all this data and look really far back in time at really, really old stuff. This is actually very recent data um, that was taken. This is actually a monster galaxy. Um, and it's, it was, it's extremely, extremely old, billions of years old, really back in the early universe. And this kind of data is going to help scientists figure out how did the universe, early universe look? Yeah. Oh, measuring. <laughs> um, what did the uni early universe look like? How much energy was out there? How big were galaxies? What was that like? Um, and see where we fit into that pattern. And so this telescope is able to take in amazing amounts of data because this is a huge huge galaxy from really far away. Um, so uh, this is some of the newer discoveries that ALMA is able to make. Oh, and I forgot to define ALMA, the Atacama Large um, Millimeter and Submillimeter Array. Pardon me. Um, it's another acronym. Most of these are. Yes, that's a really great point. Let's go back. Let's take a look at the high site. Um, that's something I totally forgot to mention, and thank you for saying that. Um, something that was really important to the Yalma team, which was an international team led by Chilean astronomers and folks down there, is that they were wor working with the community that was around um, this area. The indigenous peoples um, that are nomadic in this area are the Atacameños or the Lika Natai, um, and they actually had always used this plateau as a stargazing point. Its name is Chatnantor um, in the uh, language of the Lincoln and Thai or the Atacameños. Um, and so they actually liaised with the local groups to find the best place. They had already scoped this out, but they were like, let's work together to find the best place and make this astronomy that can work for everybody and not just foreign parties that are coming into this country, taking data and leaving. Yeah. So it was just, it was used, uh, yes, yes, um, but in, in terms of observing and astronomical um, relevance. So Chatnantor literally means launch site. Um, and so they were used, they, they, this plateau was used by the Atacameños for a very long time as a place to gaze at the stars and in a lot of spiritual ways too, but it was determined by current Atacameños that this site could be used for this purpose as well, since it was similar to the purpose it had been used to before. Great question. If it, is it fenced off? I mean, there's not a lot of people getting up there. <laughs> Great question, though. There, there aren't that many at the Comenios or Lincoln and Thai left. Um, and, and they are nomadic, you're exactly right. Um, but because there is that understanding, they are all aware of what the observatory is and things like that. Great question, though. Nope, you're exactly right. Well, I think I had surface at the lower site, which is kind of weird. But a lot of people live there, so I think they wanted it to be that way. No, not right there. This was at the lower site, which is 6,000 feet below and, and an hour drive away down the mountain. Great question, though. Thank you for bringing that up. Yes, exactly, exactly. I did not. Oh, thank you for letting um, for cal calling me out. This is one of the only photos in this slideshow. I did not take mostly because it's from the air <laughs> and I did not do much more m going up than being <laughs> on the ground right there. <laughs> it was really high already. Um, great question. Is there an airfield? Not up there that I saw. Most of the time is driving. Um, and also they have these really large, I don't see them anywhere down here. Um, they have these really, really large um, big trucks in the middle. They have like a little hole. They slide in, pick up the antenna and move it. So they're not on tracks like the VLA, but instead these trucks, one is named Olaf, I think. And the other is another German name. They were named by the designer who designed them. They're huge, two huge trucks that move them all around and it takes time to move them too. I get, that's a really great question. Yeah, drones need a little bit, maybe a little bit more air around them to work. I'm not sure how this question was taken or this picture was taken. It was um, on the ESO website. I thought it was really pretty. That's exactly right, too. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, probably not. 
Mm -hmm. So I was there for a total of 10 days. So a few, that's it. I know. (laughs) Thank you. I wish I'd been there for longer. We spent two days at CTIO. We spent three days at Alma and the rest of the time going in between or visiting other places and offices. Yeah. Yeah. They have preparations, but nothing too special just because of the different places and hilltops that they're on. They're aware of those, um, those, uh, er the earthquakes and the um, capabilities of them. However, the sites that they picked, they tried to pick sites that weren't going to be as affected. So there's still precautions in place and they are monitoring it, um, but the sites tended to be chosen because they were going to be a little bit better. They did a lot of testing. Uh, um, Back at CTIO, when we were looking over there, um, they actually, there's another hilltop just a little bit farther that you can see that's much flatter (laughs) and they wanted that hilltop so bad but the hilltop was just the not the right type of windy and so they had to pick a different hilltop so they did a lot of different testing for building these observatories to make sure that they were in the perfect site for doing this astronomy work great question all right So we also have heard about these two telescopes this weekend, which is fantastic because they are the future of astronomy. Something that blew my mind um, when I was down there and really put it in perspective is that 70%, 70, not seven, of the world's astronomy infrastructure will exist in Chile by 2020. That's amazing. That's ground-based infrastructure. Doesn't include space-based because we do have a lot of space-based telescopes. But because of these large telescope projects and international collaborations, it's going to be huge. I took this photo. Mm -hmm. This one is an artist's rendition, and that's just because it hasn't been built yet. So this telescope is the LSST, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. This telescope, when it goes online, will be an 8.4 meter telescope that will take in, you ready for it, 30 terabytes of data a night. Wow, that's a lot of data. My USB drive over there is about one gig. Um, <laughs> 30 terabytes is a lot. And so they're actually going to have a big challenge in terms of having uh, how they port the data around and process that data. But this is going to take surveys of the sky in so much in much more detail than we've ever seen before. So we're going to be able to discover so many different things, especially things that are cold and dark um, and small um, that we weren't able to see before because of this telescope. So this is the base that had already been constructed by the time I was there. This was January. Honestly, they're much farther along now. I've seen some construction pictures. If you go online on um, Gemini's website, sometimes they'll post pictures because it's their neighbors. It's on Sarah Pachone. Um, so you can see it down the way on the mountaintop and see how far it's along. You're exactly right that this is just an artist's rendition because the giant Magellan telescope isn't online yet. There are, they are, um, they have scoped the site and there's a few cranes there and that's about it. Um, but they are starting to build the telescope already. These are each 8.4 m- uh, meter mirrors. There are going to be six of them that work together adaptive optic style, so adjusting to take crazy big pictures, 10 times that of the Hubble Space Telescope, which is amazing, I know. (laughs) Wow is exactly how I I um, react every time I think about this telescope. They're making these mirrors actually right now under the football stadium stadium in Arizona. The University of Arizona. Under it, yeah. Has anybody been to to, to that lab? Yeah. So, um, so it, there's a lab um, underneath the football stadium. At, it's the University of Arizona. Yes, um, uh, a- in Arizona. And that is where a lot of really fantastic instruments, mostly mirrors, are being made for these large telescopes. It's fully insulated. Um, and it's also um, vibration proof. Otherwise, that'd be pretty dangerous, right? If you have a football game um, happening above and you're trying to create this huge mirror. Um, but there's some really fantastic, you can watch videos of these mirrors specifically being made. The glass was already made in Japan, then shipped over to Arizona. And now it's being laid and heated in a huge furnace and then smoothed out. Except in this case, these mirrors have to be potato chip form to be able to work. And these scientists are like, how do I make a mirror that big? That's a potato chip form. So it's been really, really hard going, but they finally finished the first one a little while ago and it's sitting in storage and they're making the rest of them. So this telescope's a go and it's going to be pretty amazing. That's crazy. 
so cool. <laughs> it's going to be a huge telescope. And it's another international collaboration. Lots of different countries are working on this together because they recognize how amazing astronomy can be from Chile. So it's not just one country. It's not just Chile working together. It's the entire world really recognizing that this is where astronomy is, and this especially in terms of scientific research. So how can you go to Chile? You can apply to ASAP. This is the link to apply to ASAP. You can really just type in astronomy in Chile and Amb educator ambassadors program. Um, there's a cohort every year. Um, and you can apply to go and be part of this. Um, amateur astronomers are actually the largest contingent in the program um, because we all do the most outreach. And that's what this program is about. Um, and so really, it's a fantastic opportunity to get down there to not have to do research or work, right? Because um, <laughs> that's what a lot of scientists are doing when they get down there, um, unless you want to, of course. Um, but to be able to experience these firsthand and then bring it back um, to everyone here and be able to share it uh, with the United States. Yeah. You know what? I think 18. We had somebody in college. We have uh, had a few people in college apply. Because I, I helped review applications a few times, so that's a really good question. Um, I think it says on the website, too. Yeah. So this is a way that you can get there without having to take a vacation, but I would recommend that as well because it's a pretty amazing place. All of these observatories you can access as a visitor. You don't have to be a scientist. You don't have to be part of this program. You can also just go on their tours because they want people visiting. They want people to see what's going on there because they know it's really cool. So they don't normally do tours to the high site unless it's a pretty special thing. Um, for example, Ai Weiwei, the artist, the contemporary artist, visited the high site recently. Um, I don't think he had oxygen on, actually. I'm kind of mad about that. But then again, I'm not a very famous contemporary artist. Um, <laughs> nor was I featured on Alma's Instagram. Um, so uh, that's probably has something to do with it. Um, but you can visit the low site for sure and see all of the antennas that they're working on as well. So today we've explored a little bit about what makes Chile amazing in astronomy. We've visited a few observatories and talked about how you can get involved. I would love to continue to talk about this. Um, I know we've uh, heard a lot about astronomy um, discoveries this weekend, and really a lot of the discoveries you're going to keep hearing are going to be from this amazing country. So keep an eye on it. Um, set an alert on Google, whatever it takes to just keep hearing about the news coming out of this country, because this is really where astronomy is at and going to be at um, for the next few decades at least. Um, so I definitely recommend um, spreading the word and keeping an eye, and hopefully you'll get to visit and we can talk talk about how amazing it is down there um, together as well. Um, if you have any questions, you can continue to ask me right now. I also have my business cards here, like I said. But thank you so much for coming out tonight. I really appreciate you and all the questions and comments you had, too. Thanks. Thanks. Did anybody have any other comments or questions to share with the group? If not, I'm here as well. On Alma? Fantastic. I'll have to take a look at that. I mean, it's a, like I said, fairly new telescope, but not fairly new idea. People have known that this is a good place for a while um, to do this kind of radio astronomy work. Uh, so it's a really fascinating, fascinating history. I'll have to take a look at that. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. So. Yes. Um, so Victor Blanco was the first director of CTIO. And then the, the, the telescope wasn't built until the 70s and then was commemoratively named um, after Blanco. Thank you. Yes. Um, yes. So in 2019 or 2020. So the, the interesting part about um, the eclipse in Chile, um, if you're interested in going, somebody mentioned maybe it's already booked. It is by international astronomy cohorts. But a lot of people in Chile, I actually have some coworkers down there, they're not, they're not too worried about big crowds yet. Because they're, 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 uh, the population um, down there isn't as pressed as we were during last year's eclipse. Um, they aren't learning about it as much in the media as we were at this time of year 
a year ago um, before in 2016 before our big eclipse. And so planning's for 2019 might still be a possibility. La Serena might start to be booked up because the IEU is planning a big meeting there. Um, they did just book a bunch of hotels because they want to be down there, but there's still a lot of great opportunities. Another really cool thing is that um, Chile is full of a lot of fantastic small towns. Even Coquimbo, which is a, um, a little um, uh, along the peninsula from La Serena, is a fantastic place to stay. Um, it's not where all the um, astronomy offices are, so you also could get a better chance um, in looking for hotels there too. The 2020 eclipse will be in the south, um, closer to Patagonia, so if you're interested in that temperate rainforest feel, definitely take a look at that too. Thanks for bringing that up, I appreciate it. Totally. It'll definitely be visible over the Pacific Ocean and Argentina. So if you haven't been to Argentina, that might be a good place as well.